Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us again this week for our application modernization lunch and learn series. Uh, we're here today with Dean Peterson, who's going to talk about moving from developer to architect and working with S2I and every other tool under the sun uh, to get us there. We are in week four of five. Next week, I will be presenting on the uh, migration toolkit, moving applications, how to start that kind of process. And for, uh, for those who haven't been here yet, we do have all of these recorded and all of the slides will be available at red.ht slash LNL. I will put that in the chat so you have access to that. With that said, Dean, I'll throw it over to you. All right, thanks, Richard. I'm just gonna start up sharing my screen. And so That's I've good. got one slide to start with, and then we'll be going into the demo. Uh, and the title of this is Accelerating Your Dev to Architect Journey, Mastering OpenShift, Kubernetes, and Rapid Deployment for Game-Changing Efficiency. And just wanna double check that everyone was able to see that slide before I move on to the, to the demo and what we're gonna get into. Oh, oh, here we go, okay. All right, so I, I do want to make this is not the demo, but I just wanted to make uh, you know a, a poignant statement about the the future of development and why I do think that it is so important that we you know as developers we quickly move to uh, the architect role or becoming an application architect and and finding the elegant ways to to create applications more efficiently and take advantage of the platforms that are that are currently going to streamline and accelerate your ability to create those types of applications and architectures so i just wanted to, to show you here one of these these applications i was never a react application developer um and with with the on you know the the release of ChatGPT and what you're capable of doing with that. I was able to create this AI-driven goal setter and, a, and personal assistant application in, in like a week. And I just wanna just quickly like show you just like, like anyone who's been a developer or done front-end development work too knows that, you know, you could spend a whole day just creating one user interface feature that works well. And I'm able to come in here and, you know, one of the purposes of this was to be able to create goals, tasks, put in notes, and then have the GPT-4. So not only did I use GPT to help me write this, but also I used it uh, to write, I'm using the API. And then when I put in all of this information, I'm able to assess that, that information. So I can come in and, um, you know, at, at any point in time, say assess goals, I can choose like a, a personal goal, do that and put in like, hey, how else can I make a million dollars? And then it will take all of the data and give it that context and I can analyze and it'll take, you know, it takes some time, but then um, I'm able to come in and look at these assessments and then it gives me really good feedback. And I was able to create all of this in like a week. But, you know, normally development like that would take, uh, you know, it would take a month or so. So the future really is not creating beautiful code as developers. Certainly you have to write beautiful code, but you're going to have to become an architect. You're going to have to become more efficient and deploy a lot of these moving, you know, when it comes to these microservice architectures, there's a lot of moving parts. And so that's not necessarily something in the AI sphere of, of capabilities. It's still in our sphere of how do we how do we deploy you know complex applications and and make them simple to maintain, easy to use, make them secure? That is the purview of of Kubernetes and OpenShift and and your human mind. And you know writing beautiful code, you still have to uh, to understand and have good experience to get the the, the results that you want. But you're really going to be spending a lot of time in in deploying much more sophisticated architectures. So that's where we're going to be spending our time today, and we're going to be not we're not gonna be working with a goal setter application, but we're going to be working with another application that I've created. It's a, it's a, it's a game to make this a little more interesting and exciting. So we've got a, a, a realistic you know, and real Unity game that requires a backend and it's fully driven off of 
an API that again, um, that API is actually a low code strappy backend. It, it has Red Hat single sign on, it needs Postgres databases, it, you know, it uses event driven architecture. So all of these, these moving parts that typically would be difficult for an individual if they were, you know, who, a developer who was working on their, their, their laptop to get out the door. Now you take advantage of something like OpenShift and Kubernetes and you, you know, combine that with your ability to code with, with the new AI technology that's coming down, down the line and we're integrating some of that inside OpenShift as well, then you are going to be an absolute powerhouse. But if you don't take advantage of that, then you might be in trouble, right? You've got to become the, the loom operator rather than the, the person weaving the scarf with you know, a needle and thread. So this is what we're going to do is we're going to show you how to become that loom operator. And we're going to start with source to image. So source to image, but it really under the covers, right? When it comes to getting applications deployed in a container environment, there's a lot of different ways to do that. But as a developer, I don't want to have to get down to that low level. Oh, I've got to know Docker. I have to know how to, you know, do the commands to build an efficient image so that it runs well in a container environment. It's small. It doesn't have a ton of layers. I, I mean, I've been there and, um, you know, as an application architect and developer for all of my life, you know, I, I became obsessed with what, what was possible with DevOps and, and container platforms, but I quickly got sick of getting down to that level of, of containerization. And it's indispensable to have something like an OpenShift that, yes, it uses source to image under the covers, yes, it may be, or it's build packs, what have you, to create those containers and get your applications deployed and up and running. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show some parts that are gonna be required for this game. I'm not gonna show the game at first. We're gonna build it up as we go. I'm gonna go into this project called Inter, so I have a project called Inter the Dungeon. You can think of this as a Kubernetes namespace with all the things that you need to actually be secure, bring your application to production, have role-based access control. And now also I'm gonna switch to the developer view and say, okay, and the only thing that I have running right now maybe go back a little bit, is as an admin of this platform, I've come in to, right, and said, what, what do my developers need? And you can curate this. And for, the, for right now, I need, I, I need CrunchyDB. So I have this CrunchyDB certified operator, and then I've installed it, and it's got a really good capability level of basic install, seamless upgrades, full lifecycle, deep insights. And it's like, it's like pulling a mobile application off, you know, and installing it on your phone. That's what these operators give you is the ability to and get a database like Postgres um, in the hands of a developer and self-serve for the, that developer. So we're going to self-service ourselves uh, and create a crunchy DB da uh, database in just a minute um, after we get the application that, that requires it up and running. So we're going we're to see uh, this process where we come in as a developer and we've got these operators installed that are then gonna give us the capabilities that our application needs in order to function, which normally maybe you'd have to go to a shared environment that runs, um, you know, uh, that runs a, a, a database in a shared environment and then you have to connect to that. Maybe you're, you're stepping on each other's toes. So what you want is a really efficient self-service environment that makes it easy for developers to do everything they need with the click of a button or a command line, you know, single command. And, and so let's get started here. Let's go and say, what do we need? We're going to add an application, but we're not going to get down to that level. We're going to use some source to image. And you don't really see that as a developer. You're not thinking, oh, source to image. How, you know, how does that work? What are the, what are all the moving parts to that? All you care is, Hey, I've, I've got some source. My source in this case is a Node.js application. It's pure source. And um, it's, so if you come in, look at the source and look at our, our you know, API and all the different things that are involved with this, there's, it's just a Node.js application. And I don't have to, as a developer, know anything more than the code that I wrote and I checked in. I'm gonna take this Git repository URL and then I'm going to drop it in. 
and it's going to tell me, hey, this is a private repository. So we're going to we're going to bring in our source secret. So you can in this environment create secrets. Um, we're going to create secrets. Developer. So let's go back to the admin view. Uh, secrets into the dungeon. So I'm going to create a secret. I've got to bring this off into a different screen. Secrets, I can come in, create a secret, key, key value, uh, source secret. I'm going to call it GitHub. Okay, and we'll bring this back. We're going to go back into our developer view. We're going to go add, git. Copy that. GitHub. And then it's going to tell us, hey, you've got these options for what type of application that it's going to combine your code with. And so it's got these builder images. So that's what source image will do is it will say, okay, you've, you've got a Node.js application. You're going to come in. A lot of times it will auto detect, but when you have a private repository, you know, it, you'll 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 come in here and say, all right, I'm I'm going to deploy a Node.js application, and you're going to give it a name. In this case, I'm going to call it Strappy. So this is my low-code backend that's going to give us our REST our REST API. I'm going to call it Strappy. And then I'm going to expose it via a route, and that allows external traffic to come in and hit it. And so let's make sure everything's correct. Got our GitHub private key. We're going to hit create. We're going to go to our builds. And if we look at our build that's running, so the first thing that it does is it pulls that code. and you have all of the moving parts, so rather than having to get down to that level of, oh, you know, Docker, you know, here's my Docker file. I'm going to do a Docker command or a Podman command, if you will. All of those those components to build your application and turn it into a container. You've got that builder image. You've got your source code. It takes it. It's gonna. It's combining now, so it's triggered a, a pod that's running. And there's a, and then at the end of this, you're going to have that builder image combined with your source code. It's going to turn that into a complete container image, and it's going to check that into an internal registry. So all of those things that you would normally have to really be a, a fairly, you know, efficient Kubernetes expert or OpenShift expert at, you don't have to be as a developer. You can just get your code up and running. And once this is done, we're going to see, uh, you know, this thing turn to green complete. And at the end, you should you should see a log that says push uh, successful. So we're gonna we're gonna wait for that. But we don't necessarily have to wait. We're gonna get some other components up and running too. We're gonna go back to the administrator view and we're gonna take advantage of our our operators that we ha have already installed. And in, so we would come in and we would take a look at as a developer. All right, my admin curated a set of operators, if you will, that gives me native you know, a, a Kubernetes native Kubernetes native way to deal with, for example, a Postgres database or a Red Hat single sign-on instance. So in this case, we're going to get um, something up and running here. We're going to go to our Crunchy DB, and actually, I'm going to I'm going to yes, I'm gonna go and I'm going to go and remove because one of the one of the things that it does out of the box that Crunchy DB gives you is the ability to automatically back up and restore based on um, an S3 bucket. Let me just go there really quick and clean that bucket out. I'm going to come in here. 
my S3. I'm going to go down to my strappy lunch demo backup, and I'm going to say empty that before we get started. So permanently leak. All right, so now that that's empty, we're going to come back and we're going to spin up our crunchy db so we can create a if you go in like there's a command line just like if you're familiar with kube cuddle there's an oc command line you could say oc get um crunchy db da databases so we're going to create this postgres database i'm going to use some yaml that i have prepared uh depending on the the configuration that you need to to make you could more or less just use what's already in place but I'm going to drop in one that I have with all the settings that are required. All right, looks good. So what we're doing is we're actually, we're storing some data that I have in a different S3 bucket, and then it's automatically going to set up future backups for you that's gonna to push to a different S3 bucket. I'm gonna go ahead and hit um, create. We're gonna take a look at our pods that are currently running. And you'll notice that we have this deployment. So our build was successful, but we currently don't have a database that's backing this, this pod that's trying to run with our, with our strappy application. So it can't. Uh, so as a developer, I don't wanna to have to wait for somebody to go and spin up a Postgres database for me or go connect to a shared database where I'm gonna start knocking, you know, like messing up people's data. I want my own data. I want my own database. This gives you just a rapid fire way to do that. You could, you could see how you could put this into an integration test and easily have this automated to spin up and be ready for the application um, that, that you need. But right now, we're doing um, uh, this. There's a restore that has to happen here. And I just need one more um, S3 key. One second. I'm going to go here, give my S3 key to the system. I got to bring this off since we're going to be recording this. I don't want that little secret, create, source secret, and it's going to be, I'm going to create it from YAML. You can't see this, but that's what I'm doing right now. Create that. And then we're going to bring this back over. And the nice thing about this system is it self heals. So eventually what we could do is if we wanted to speed things up and not make it wait, we can just say, hey, delete that pod. A replication controller will come back and say, well, I wasn't done with my, my PG, in my, my restore. So now I'm going to spin up another pod because I need, you know, everything is declarative in Kubernetes and OpenShift. And it says, what state do I need to be in? It's constantly looking, there's pods. So a lot of times these operators, they're responsible for getting what you declared that you want into the state that, that it needs to be in. So when I deleted that pod, it knew that it needed to restore, that restore hadn't happened. So it needed to spin up another pod. Um, there was a replication controller that said, okay, we need at least one of these things running that's gonna restore everything. It takes about two minutes to get us where we need to be, and then the rest of the pods for the database will spin up while we're waiting for that. Let's go to our other installed operator, and we're gonna go and create, we want single sign-on. We wanna know when somebody's playing our game who that is, so we need authentication. This one's even easier. The key cloak requires its own Postgres database, so it has templates. It's an operator that, that, that will create all the infrastructure that you need and all you have to do is come in here and just change the name. I'm going to change this to Strappy Key Cloak. I'm going to hit Create. And we can go back again and look at our pods. And more stuff is happening. Our restore completed. And now our Postgres database for our application is coming up online. As well as now our Key Cloak, our Red Hat single sign-on is coming up online. Did I have to create Docker files for any of this? Did I have to, as a developer, know anything really about the underlying container infrastructure? No. 
and that's the way as a developer I like it. I just want to get stuff done. And so I'm getting a lot done right now and I'm self-servicing. And then once we have all of these components up and running, we can come in here and it looks like everything is pretty good to go. We're gonna just say delete that pod and the, delete, and the pod knows that it needs at least one pod running. So then it's gonna spin back up. And now we've got this um, database or this application that should eventually, once things are running. Oh, there's a service that I need to create. So I need to create one more thing. The, there's a service, a kind service, and the logs are really nice to help you figure out what you're missing. I'm gonna come in here, and a service is like the internal load balancing to things. And I'm gonna create a new service that's basically gonna point in another way to that same Postgres database. I'm gonna go ahead and create that. I'm gonna go back to my pod. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that pod. And then that should stay running this time. We're gonna to go to our network. So when we created using source to image, that ability to communicate externally to our cluster and our running containers, so how it works is you don't have to be a networking expert either to get traffic to your containers and you can spin up as many containers as you want for your services. And then there is, so as, I, as I created that service, that service is the internal load balancer. So if you had some internal applications, it can use that internal service name. So you never have to go externally. But then when you want to talk ex, you know, externally, then you need that HA proxy router that then uses uh, DNS entries to then eventually route to your service, then onto your containers. And so we've got a key cloak application, we've got a strappy application running that are both exposed. We need to first, well, let's take a look at our Strapi application that's up and running. We can go to the admin. And we're gonna come in and take a look at our content manager. So we've got all of these things that were restored for us automatically in this new instance of, of Strapi from the CrunchyDB database operator. We've got a bunch of, you know, this is the, this is the backing objects, entities, if you will, for our game. And, that's, and the game is pulling all of that stuff dynamically, the monsters, the rooms, and we'll get to showing that in a second, but we have to get our key cloak configured. Let's go back to key cloak. And when we spun that up, we were given some secrets. And so I, I can share these because this is just a temporary key cloak instance that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do away with after this, this event. So I've, I've got to log in and I have to restore my clients and some configuration in order for our game to be able to have users log in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go to my key cloak instance, and again, it's a nice little handy way of running in here. Going to spin up my key cloak, get into my admin console. I'm gonna go to admin. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, we're gonna add a realm. And how we add a realm, I've got a trusty little uh, file that I'm gonna go to that I had exported from Red Hat Single Sign-On. And let me copy all, oh wait, actually, I'm gonna download that. So it's our realm export five. We're gonna come in we're gonna go select a file, we're gonna go realm export five, enabled create. So what that does is it creates a new realm called enter the dungeon. And now we have clients that we can use that uh, like ITD Unity that have credentials that also give us our valid redirect URLs and things like that. And now that we have that all set up, let's actually spin up our game. We're gonna to add to our game some event-driven architecture, but we'll, we'll first show what it is that, that we just accomplished. And uh, we're gonna come in here, spin that up. And 
you probably can't hear the sound. Um, that's not important. So I'm going to log out first, and then I'm going to log back in. And you'll notice that this has that same URL uh, that we had that we we're hitting with the key cloak uh, route. So now we can come in and register a new user. We're going to say, um, Dean Peterson, uh, Peterson .dean at gmail.com. I like uh, I like He Man and the Masters of the Universe. I'm going to go with Grayskull. I'm an 80s kid. And put in a password. I'm going to register. And now it says I can go ahead and return back to the app. Now I'm logged in. And I can enter the dungeon. I've given, I've, so all of this stuff was created. There was the API was being called by, you know, talking to Strappy on the back end that created the initial hand. So we can go in and, and look, you know, when we take a look at where that came from, like our, our deck, we got that from an initial hand that was, should have been just created. So it was created today, 427 at 1128. You can see that. And so we're just, we're just going to go ahead and play the game a little bit. Go ahead and click, select our Axie. Enter the dungeon. It'll give you a little bit of a tutorial. And now it's pulling in, you can see all of these requests to Strappy. It's pulling in the data, it's pulling in the monster, you know, randomly selecting a room based on a set of criteria. And we just have to beat the monster's score using these cards. All right, we're gonna, boom. All right, we've only got three. Now we're gonna do one more time. And we're gonna collect this, but you'll, so what happens is as you go along, Right. If you were to leave, the point of it is you want to leave the dungeon before you lose. That way you'll get to collect whatever you, you gained along the way. And what you gained along the way in this case are cards. So snail shield. So you'll notice we, we gained a snail shield, but we won't actually have that in our, our we've attained this. But if we go, our, go to our deck manager and look to see how we can build a deck in the future, we don't have anything from the game that we just played. We collected those cards, but they're not there. That's where the event-driven architecture comes in place. You know, you don't want to, when somebody is expecting that they gain something in a game, um, you don't want to do a one-time request to a service in a restful way. You, you know, what's more resilient is to do it in an event-driven way. So you send a simple message that says, oh, I've got a number of systems that need to respond to this. And in this case, I've done, some some work, right? Done something similar where we come in uh, in a different namespace now. I'm going to switch to a different namespace, go to projects, and I've got this AMQ broker. And so I've done something similar where I've got installed operators, I've got the AMQ broker, and it also introduces a number of native things that let you let you work with um, things like queues and topics declaratively, like those other th things, so that they're native. And when I need to spin up a broker, again, I can do this in a self-service way. I did this really easily. I didn't have to know anything about containers. I spun that up. Once I had that, then I created some queues. I created some queues declaratively. And the YAML for that is very simple, very small. And then once that's there, there's an operator that's running that's saying, oh, you want to be in this state. You need this queue. Let me do that for you. And it creates it. OK, that's all fine and good. So I have, a, I have a game now that's sending messages to the system. So a message was sent to this queue. So it's sitting there waiting to be consumed, but I don't have a consumer for that. So that's where I wanted to bring up another slide deck uh, or a slide. So we have source to image. That's great. We've got source code, or maybe you even have an existing container. You've got all these different ways that you can get containers running or you get your applications running inside a container app, uh, platform like OpenShift and Kubernetes. But we take it like there's that we're just touching the you know the tip of the iceberg today. But I did want to demonstrate or show this where you can start getting a little bit even more sophisticated and say, oh, I I want to get really lightweight. I want to get you know I want to get really efficient. And you can kind of go down in terms of integration and taking messages that went into a queue and putting and then maybe taking that message and then writing that to the database in an asynchronous event-driven way, you can go down, oh, this camel two path, if you guys are like a spring boot shop or an EAP shop, use Fuse. 
or take advantage of CAMEL3 and all of the work that's been done to make it efficient to write integrations with Quarkus, CAMEL-K. We're gonna get down, we're gonna, we're gonna stay in these two areas right here where we've got some camel Quarkus and CAMEL-K and we've created an integration. But CAMLets is, a, is again a way to, to bring everything up to an even more declarative state that you can start tying, hey, I've got a source of data and I've got a destination for the data and I don't wanna have to reach for code or I don't wanna have to do all of these things manually. I wanna be really efficient. We've got the tools, you know, there's tools for you to do that. You know, as a developer, you gotta start thinking more of an architect, less of I can, I can write really good code. And I do wanna bring up um, what I've done in this case. So I've got this application and it's really simple. So when that game is running, it's sending a message that says, oh, they've collected these cards, send that to the AMQ broker, but then something has to extract those and put it into the database for me asynchronously. So I've got this AMQ consumer, and this could be using Camlets, but in this case, I'm just, I'm, I'm using Quarkus and I'm using all of the things that, you know, we've got, dis, you know, there's distributions that, that are supported that I don't have to make. And all I really have to make in this case is one class, one Java class. I don't even, I don't even bring in jar dependencies. When I need jar dependencies, um, like I have a shared kernel, I use something like called Jitpack. Like I just focus on this one little piece and I'm saying, all right, process that message as it comes through and it's gonna go from that player left processor queue and then it's gonna split the, the messages. There may be a number of them and I'm gonna send that to my strappy back end. So I've got all of that set up, but what I don't have, if I come back and look at my um, projects again, and I'm gonna go to my camel K, and once again, we reach for our operators. And what do I have? I have another operator that I can use called the Red Hat integration for camel K. And it, once you have your integration platform in place, then you can just create integrations. I don't have an integration running right now, so how do I do that? Well, in order to do that, Pretty simple. I come in and I run one line of code against my, one second. I'm gonna come in here. I'm gonna say CD camel, uh, no. Camel player card consumer. So that's where my code is. I've got my AMQ consumer. I'm gonna say OC project, make sure I'm on the right project. So I'm in my Camel K ITD. And one, one of the things that I want you to notice, and I'm gonna make this a little bigger here, is this Prometheus.enabled equal to true. And if we look at the code one more time, I promise I won't make you look at the code too many more times. I've got in here this Quarkus small rye open API, and that will automatically put in a metrics endpoint that then Prometheus, and I'm gonna show you how you can then take, a, take advantage of and take a look at the, the metrics that this thing automatically gives to you and starts integrating with the Prometheus uh, system that is collecting those types of things for the individual applications. And I've, I've also enabled the user, uh, user defined namespace metrics. I'm gonna deploy this. I'm gonna hit, hit that. And then it says created. It's already up and running. That little piece of code was turned into, into a container and it's up and running. I can take a look at, at the resources behind it. I'm gonna go and take a look at the pod. I'm gonna look at the logs. Um, now, there's a little bit of an issue here. Camel K consumer failed delivery for message ID. Oh, that's probably from the previous message. So let's just go back to our game and see if we have any better luck with saving our our uh, messages about which which um, cards we've collected. Let me come in here. Let's make sure we get a message that we might not actually win. <laughs> okay, we lost. We gotta we gotta come back in. 
leave. I'm going to enter the dungeon again. This time we're going to win. All right. Oh, no. Did it do it to me again? No. We're going to win this time. All right. Barely. Um, okay. We've got our snail shield. That's unique enough where it normally wouldn't be in, so we can see it. I'm going to leave here, go to the deck manager, and we've got our snail shield now. So that means our message was successful. So we used, you know, a combination of things now to get the job done in a resilient way. And we can come and take a look at the logs, and you can see that that message that was just sent. So it was, it was, it was consuming a previous message that was in an unhealthy state. But this new message that we sent, you can see, hey, it, it pulled that from the AMQ broker, and then it sent it on to the to the Strapi backend database. So now you might be thinking, you know, how do I bridge that gap between what I'm doing as a developer and ultimately what the DevOps team or the operations team needs to do to get this to production and not have everybody think that the developers are going wild in the system. I want to give you a little bit of a a, a taste for that as well. So I'm actually going to, you know, we've done all this work now, kind of sad to see it go, but let's go to our other project, into the dungeon, go to our pods, and I'm going to, I'm going to kill everything. I'm just going to, it's all going to go away. And I'm going to do that with a uh, command. Right, let's go to ED. We're going to go to CD, IT, the demo, steps, and we're going to do a complete clean, SH. I'm going to watch these things disappear. So they're terminating. And all we're going to be left with is our operator pods running that are going to be waiting, and our build, that are going to be waiting for more declarative state but we've just removed everything. Another thing that we have, right, you need production grade CI/CD pipelines. We're gonna focus on the deployment. So we've got OpenShift GitOps to work with. We're gonna, we're gonna go to our cluster version of, of Argo CD. And what I've done is everything that we had before, I, I, I forgot one step, but we did like, when we were able to come in here, and I, I wish I had shown this before I killed everything, but I had build configs, I had builds, uh, you know, I had the routes, I had the services, so as, as you saw those things. I extract, that's all YAML. So I extracted that YAML and I put it into a Git repository and it looks, it looks like this. So I'm gonna come in and take a look at my repository that I have of YAML. So this is, before I just, just you know, deleted all of that, this was the YAML that was there. The developer didn't know, so as a developer, I didn't know that I was creating these things, but I was, and that is there for me as an operations team to extract and put into a production, you know, continuous deployment solution, or even in the continuous integration solution. As I mentioned, we're gonna focus on the, on the CD. So I have, uh, I have my routes, I've got my, um, my service, I've got my uh, in, instance of key cloak that I was going to create, even my crunchy DB. So if I come in and look at my, um, where is it? My crunchy DB database. So all of that I've declared inside YAML, put into a Git repository, and then I can come into my application created, and I spun this up too with an operator. But before I do that, I, I just wanted to show, we come in here, we go to, Operator Hub, and we look at um, GitOps, so OpenShift, so Red Hat OpenShift GitOps. It's upstream. It's based on Argo CD, so that you'll get advantage, you'll be able to take advantage of the open. You know, everything is open source, right? That we do, so you're not locking yourself into anything, and that's the great thing, right? All of the the stuff that we're doing here, we're just being being a really efficient with Kubernetes and using it as a developer to get stuff done. I don't want to have to 
curate everything upstream and get it all working. The, uh, you need role-based access control and OpenShift logins to work with your, your GitOps. That's what this that's what this does. It'll get you up, you spin it up just like we did with the other solutions using an operator. And now I'm gonna create a new application. And that new application is going to be, um, you know, my into the dungeon, project name, default manual, repository URL is gonna be this ITD demo YAML. The path is just, it's enter the dungeon and the cluster URL is gonna be my native and the namespace is gonna be enter dungeon. I'm gonna go ahead and say create. And then I'm just gonna, there's nothing more satisfying and simple then all of that work that I did as a developer, encapsulating that into YAML, checking it into a Git repository, putting it into a pipeline and hitting synchronize. And watching as we went from zero and it took some time, even though I was really efficient as a developer, you know, you can't, you gotta get these things deployed really efficiently in, um, you know, in the actual production world. Maybe you've got a you know, hundred clusters that you're deploying to. We're gonna go back into Enter the Dungeon. Everything was gone. Now we're doing the same thing that we did before. Strappy, that application is, is sitting there spinning, waiting for the restore to occur. Everything that we waited for before and we did manually. Now we can put into a CD pipeline. We extracted everything the developer did. We don't have to guess. We bridged that gap between that developer and the operations team very nicely. And now you can have everything you need in order to turn that into a production um, CI CD pipeline that you can then deploy on any number of clusters. And again, we just, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg with, with all of this, but um, I think that's what I wanted to get across is just how efficient you can be as a developer and then help um, bring the work that you do to a level that makes it very easy to get your applications to production. All right, and I think with that, that's, uh, we'll, we've got 15 minutes left for questions, if there are any. And I'm going to shut my game off because I don't know if anyone can hear that, but it's making noise. <laughs> none of it, none of it came through on our side, but it, it seems to have, uh, uh, at least none of the sound, but all of the images were there. Um, I'm going to encourage anybody who has any questions for Dean, um, go ahead and post them in chat. I'm watching. Uh, the nice part about Blue Jeans Prime Time is you can't always. Um, so, in in talking, if we were to extrapolate this into like the modernization story of, uh, we'll say a company already has their game implemented, right? So, so they have their game written. We uh, will say it's in a legacy Java double E application where maybe that's it's with some EJB calls and it's doing a lot of this. Um, where do you think a good, um, the, the good first step for kind of that self-service mentality on uh, maybe some like you talked about the self-service for AMP broker, you talked about um, how developers uh, working fast is kind of the goal, right? It opens all of these doors. What would you say would be a great first, first look, right? The first path. Yeah, I think the first path is you, ha you, you create an environment that is, that is fairly open. It's a sandbox environment that has the capabilities that, um, that we demonstrated today. And rather than start with the, the continuous integration, continuous deployment. So as you notice, I left that part to, to, to the end. And that's what's unique about OpenShift is there is no other platform where day one you get it installed. You can hand it off to us, you know, in a sandbox environment and say, you know what? Hey, we, you have an, an idea, you know, the types of architectures you're trying to create. And with, you know, a, a very minimal amount of, of knowledge about containers, you can get started day one. But you have to, you know, you don't want to start with that. Like, well, how do we first, wait, 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 let's start with continuous integration. Let's start with, with how do we put this into a Jenkins or a Tecton pipeline? Let's start with, well, okay, what operators do you need access to? Let's curate those for you. Let's create a, let's create a, a platform and a, a cluster that has the, 
the operators that will facilitate your self-service. So the admins will come in, curate that list, give those capabilities to those developers, and then you know, kind of work hand in hand with the solution. And then, then once you have your solution in place, you work backwards from there to create your CI/CD pipeline and take advantage because there's like we, it, it's like the stuff that we have for continuous integration, continuous deployment has been there for a long time and it's evolved so well that it's become really, really good. Don't be tempted to be like, oh yeah, that you know, we want to use this part of it, but we're gonna do, we're gonna build our containers externally and you know we're gonna use this other tool because then you're you know you're leaving a lot on the table. And and so I think it would be it would be of everyone's benefit to say this is 2023 AI is blowing everyone's mind we don't we don't have time to be the platform creators and that that can take on many different forms and that form a lot of times it could be completely do it yourself and I've seen it do more often than I would like to to say but then it can also be like well yeah well we're not that that source to image stuff is all well and good, but um, really yeah. we like to have full control over creating you know Docker containers from the ground up. And again, that might be fine in some cases where you need to do that, but you are going to leave a lot on the table in terms of of hey, put plugging in that machine brain and saying that thing knows how to create containers that are really efficient and allows me to put that into a you know we've got things for CI/CD that fit natively and nicely into that. And then all of that will work to your advantage that you don't have to get down to that low level to build those components yourself. I would say the place to start is check, check the mindset of how much time do I have? What business do I, am I in? I wanna get stuff done. Let's get that sandbox in place and see what developers um, need to create and then work backward from there is where I would say start. It's yeah. That, uh, so that feels a lot like uh, flipping uh, the the modern paradigm on its head, right? Where it's it's very often like, well, I'm just going to start building this application, and then I need to figure out the CI/CD process. Versus, I have a platform that I need to prepare everybody for, and to uh, if nothing else, build guardrails to to make sure that Absolutely. they can move in this direction without necessarily veering off the side of the road and down the canyon, which leads to usually a really expensive cloud bill or, yep. you know, yep. something of the like. That promise of operational control and developer flexibility, meeting the middle is where, you know, we've been talking about it for over a decade, but you have to have the right tools and you, you, you know, you have to have the right mindset to, to, to get there and, and, that's where you want to take as much help as you can. And, and, and so hopefully I showed a little bit of how you can do that today. So one of, one of the challenges, and um, for those who have been attending a couple of these sessions and you've heard me talk a couple of times, uh, you've heard me say I come from a development background and um, I, I know many good friends come from the operations background and we tend to, I don't want to say, that there's no trust between the two parties, but it definitely always comes across as, hey, you know, I'm the operations guy, I know the platform, the developers code, no, I know the application, so I know what's right. And that tends to uh, cause some headbutting, that tends to cause some challenges in this kind of modernization space. Um, where would you suggest, like, how could S2Y kind of help with maybe that best practice? Like where could they go to kind of be better about that? So, well, I might not answer your question directly, but I do think that it's the forces that are occurring that are going to, because it's, it's not either, neither side, you know, the, the reason why we really haven't come together yet. I think it's because things were good enough. It's like why planes haven't evolved for the last 30, 40 years, right? They were good enough. But the forces that are occurring with, with how easy it is to create really good applications by plugging in that machine brain is gonna force developers to sit up and pay attention. All of this innovation that was happening on the operations side of the house with CICD, and then you know trying to be like, hey, 
you know, development teams, did you know we were putting all of this stuff in place? And then the developers are like, yeah, I've got all this code to write. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily have time. I think there's going to be the that coming together is, is pretty much here. It's going to be forced. Developers are going to say, oh, they're kind of, we're going to stick our heads up kind of like groundhogs and be like, yeah, in order to be really, you know, bring value, be efficient. I think that's going to happen. So I don't know if that answered your question, but in terms of source to image, you know, it's just, it's just one of the tools in the toolbox that I think you're going to have to use in order to bring enough value. I don't want to be harsh and say, say like it just to bring enough value to, to, you know, to compete. That's really where, where it is at this point. Yeah. Like understanding that maybe like there, there are optimized way to do things and the way that uh, customer X or customer Y necessarily does it might be good, but you know, this is something that becomes tribal knowledge. It becomes uh, maintained right internally versus uh growing and evolving with the community, with uh, all of the resources behind it, yeah, which absolutely. You know, is a challenge in itself. And I, I enjoy the, um, I, I would say the first part of your answer to the previous question, I would say is almost a, we'll say Newtonian and say an object in motion will stay in motion unless <laughs> acted on an uh, outside force. Uh, the outside force in this case being, you know, AI and things like chat GPT. <laughs> I like how you put it. Yep. I, I think we're going to see a lot more collaboration here um, in, in the like today. I think I think it's 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 a good thing the things that are happening, and um, you know the 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 thing is is when you know when you lift your head up and take a look around, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised, uh, pleasantly not surprised, but excited to see what you actually have at at, at your disposal. Um, and then you don't like just the, the amount of, you know, mental energy that's required to get really good software out the door. Take advantage of the tools that you have in order to to be 10x, 100x. Sometimes now, I mean, the sky's the limit on how efficient you can be. If you lift your head up, take a look around and then take advantage of what's been what been done for the last seven years, ten, you know. I'd say everything's accelerating. Mm -hmm. And as developers, sometimes that's a challenge, right? Of of buying your time, of saying that I understand that we are going to constantly have a backlog of business, but sometimes as developers, we do need to lift our head up and, and take a look at what's out there and get fresh eyes on the processes and the initiatives that we take internally as there could be things out there that we aren't taking advantage of today that could make us that 10, 15, 100x uh, style of developer. Absolutely. Well, with that, um, I don't see any other questions in chat, so I do want to thank Dean for uh, your presentation today. Thank you for uh, talking with us and presenting. Um, this was week four of five for our uh, application modernization lunch and learn series. Next week, uh, you'll all be stuck with me. Uh, I'm going to be presenting on the uh, migration toolkit for applications, um, kind of getting started, moving applications into a container, uh, upgrading applications, what that looks like, and how you can take advantage of something to, like Dean talked to us today, um, having uh, set rules, set things in place to where you don't have to do all the work yourself. So once again, thank you everybody for attending and I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you.